<sighs> That's right. <laughs> Sorry, you're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. You were sassy. You talked back. Now he'll put you in his sack. Welcome, everybody, to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. And hey, a special thanks to uh, Josh Roseman for his uh, his his music. There is that right? Or yeah, uh, that's that's Josh Roseman, the author of today's story. Oh no, no, the the other one, the, the trombonist. Oh, all oh, right. I always I always get those two mixed up. Well, both of them contribute equally to the show. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good, I guess. So, introducing the holiday season, everybody. Oh, that's not what you meant. You're mocking me, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll just cut all that out. That can be the outtakes. Okay, everybody. Uh, so, welcome on this beautiful, freezing, effing cold December evening. It is the lovely holiday season. There's snow on the ground, at least where we are. And in our hearts. Yes, and in our minds, unfortunately. Okay. Kind of having a hard time keeping up with things because of that. But yeah, it's uh, it's the holiday season. Most of the holidays, I guess, are already past us uh, this holidays because uh, ha- Hanukkah was really early this year. It was Thanksgivinga, I guess, this year they called it because it, it was actually on the same night. One of the nights of Hanukkah was on the same night as Thanksgiving. It was so early. So all that's left really is Christmas and New Year's and Kwanzaa. I think. And maybe uh, the solstice? Oh, I what else is there? I thought you were going to mention Krampusnacht. Oh, Krampusnacht, my favorite of the holidays. <laughs> Although I think that one's passed already. Too. It, it has, yes. But if I had my way, it would be everyone's favorite of the holidays. Yes, Krampusnacht. If I had my way, it would be every nacht. <laughs> <laughs> Vita, Vita. Yes. Uh, Nine. <laughs> today's story is by the famous trombonist Josh Roseman. Oh, no. Again, the other one. Oh, the other one, not the famous trombonist, is the author of today's story, Josh Roseman. And, uh. Roseman. That's the one. He has returned with a sequel to last year's holiday offering. That story was called Secret Santa. Today's story is called Secret Santa 2. Electric Boogaloo. Um, close. It does have one of those colons and then the subtitle, but the subtitle is Krampusnacht. All right, that's better than Electric Boogaloo, really. Yeah, really it is. Yes, briefly, if you haven't listened to Secret Santa, which was his broken mirror his winningest broken mirror entry last year, you really owe it to yourself to listen to that one first because this, like a good sequel, picks up where the last one left off. It, it doesn't, it, it slightly recaps what happened in the first one, but it, it's all the better if you've read or if you're familiar with the first one. Yeah, if you haven't heard it, you should check it out. There's a link in the show notes that goes to that story. Also, there's a link in the show notes in case you really enjoy that story to go over to... It's, is, is it a link to that Carl's Jr. commercial where the supermodel is eating, like, the really messy burger? You mean all Carl's Jr. commercials? <laughs> no, I would be strung up by my toes by a, a good half of our listeners if I provided a link to that commercial, unfortunately. Well, l- listen, on behalf of the other half, please put a link to that, <laughs> would you? But there is also a link to the story, which is available on Kindle now. You can get it for your Kindle. Josh Roseman has released it, along with some of his favorite trombone hits. <laughs> no? I, yes, yes, I'm sure. This is... <laughs> okay. It's available on Kindle now if you want to read it that way. as You you could read it and listen to it, like, at once. Have you ever done that? Read a book and listened to the audiobook of it at the same time? I did do that once when Stephen King put out The Gunslinger again with, like, all these revisions. 
just because I was like, wow, I'm curious how revised this is. Uh And yeah, that was a very interesting experience. I mean, if you have no life at all. (laughs) But uh, no, other than that, I I don't think I ever have. Yeah, I did that once. I focus, I, I use a different part of my brain to listen than I do to read. You know what I mean? Yeah. I did that once when we were driving on a long trip. We went to Canada and we had a Dean Koontz book. I'm sorry. On audio that we were listening to. And then by chance, I found that Dean Koontz book on like the super bargain place at the bookstore while we were in Canada. And so I bought it for like four bucks, which at the time translated over to like two bucks because of the exchange rate. And so I was like, yeah, totally. I'll go for it. And then I didn't read the whole book that way. But for a long time, whenever I wasn't driving and stuff, I would follow along with the book for the heck of it. Well, did it change the experience to have the text in front of you? No. Uh, Sometimes it's interesting, though, because at least you know how some words that aren't regular words, like wacky names or German words like Krampusnacht, you know, how they're spelled. Anyways, we're just going to get on to the story right now and let you listen to it and enjoy it. We'll see on the flip side with maybe like a, I don't know, after the story, we might have like a cast list. No, let's not do that. Let's let's switch it up this time. (laughs) About the author. Josh Roseman. Not the trombonist, the other one. Right. Lives in Georgia. Not the country Georgia, but the state in the United States. His fiction has previously appeared in Asimov's Escape Pod and the Crossed Genres Anthology, Fat Girl in a Strange Land. This is his fourth appearance on the Doonstief and his third Doonstief original. Secret Santa 2, Krampusnacht, is the sequel to Secret Santa. To keep up with Josh, visit his website, roseplusman.com, or find him on Twitter at listener42. All right, folks, enjoy Krampusnacht. La 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 la. Secret Santa 2 Krampusnacht by Josh Rosenberg. December 4, 7.30 p.m. Wes felt weird. And not the kind he was used to, either. The kind where he had the abilities and powers of Santa Claus. That kind of weird was standard. Had been ever since the elves had decided not to make him the next incarnation of Father Christmas. Now Wes was used to being invulnerable, to traveling via chimney or closet, to the ability to pull pretty much whatever he needed out of any bag he had handy, to read people's minds and pick out exactly what they wanted most. No, all of that was normal. Normal for him, anyway. This, this was different. Though he'd been on the run from the professor and his elf hit squad since last Christmas, things had quieted down after Halloween. For the past month, Wes had been renting a room at a travel lodge just outside Atlanta. Paying for it was easy. He just had to reach into his duffel bag, pull out a collectible baseball card or comic book, and sell it. He was making less than he would by putting it on eBay, but there was the whole don't let anyone know where you are thing to deal with as well. That, plus the occasional bout of vigilantism. Stopping criminals was easy when he couldn't be harmed by an adult and he kind of liked that the news websites called him Secret Santa, kept a roof over Wes's head and enough money in his wallet for food. At least the bag gave him the vitamins and medications he needed to take daily after his failed gastric bypass surgery. And wasn't that a real treat? All the rigmarole of a major physical readjustment, none of the benefits. Stupid elves. Wes had a sinking feeling that the weirdness he felt was related to the elves and to his near-Santa experience. It was similar to, but not exactly like, the little precognitive tingles he would get when the hit squads got close to him. Wes motioned over his server and handed her a 20. I have to run, he said. Keep the change, okay? Thank you, she said, smiling. I really appreciate it. Wes knew that, had seen in her mind that she was squirreling away money to buy a gift for her daughter, who was turning five right around Christmas time and he knew she was working two jobs to make ends meet. If he'd been able, he'd have given her more. But that would have been suspicious. Wes shoved down a couple of fries, sucked two big gulps out of his water glass, 
and got the hell out of the restaurant. He crossed the street, clomped up the stairs to his second-floor room, and bolted the door. Not that that would work if the elves came for him, but it made him feel better. That just left the problem of what was making Wes feel so weird. And, try as he might, he just couldn't put a finger on it. December 4, 8.30 p.m. Wes was about to pull his hair out. The weird feeling had kept getting stronger and stronger, and now he could swear there was a directional pull to it, too. He hadn't dared use the Travel Lodge's business center to do any Googling. And he didn't have a phone or computer would have defeated the purpose of being off the grid. So he'd been stuck racking his brains, trying to decide if he was still safe or if he should pack his stuff and find a new hotel. He'd gone so far as to scoop all his toiletries into a bag and open and shut his closet three or four times. But every time he did, he would just shove the door shut and go back to the bed, where he was sitting right now. And then something changed. He suddenly had an uncontrollable urge to stand up, to go to the mirrored bifold of his closet door, to nudge it open and pull his official bag, really just a plain black duffel that had once upon a time been a sorry attempt at a gym bag, over his shoulder before stepping inside. He couldn't say where he was headed, only that he knew he had to be somewhere else. Wes pulled the door shut from the inside, closed his eyes, and concentrated. December 4, 8.32 p.m. Wes tumbled out of a fireplace big enough for him to stand upright in. He climbed to his feet, dusted himself off, and took stock of his surroundings, which were, truthfully, pretty boring. It was just a massive industrial concrete fireplace at one end of the room, and a heavy metal door at the other. Wes tried to peer through the tall, narrow window, but the glass was frosted. No go there, and nothing to do but push the door open as gently as possible, every click of the metal mechanism louder than the crack of an iceberg. It opened onto a hallway with more ubiquitous concrete blocks painted in two tones of industrial green with a white stripe at waist level. No windows and no doors other than the one he'd just come through. It felt for all the world like he was in some sort of mental hospital. But why would his enhanced senses be bringing him here? Wes took a moment to listen out, as hard as he could. But all he heard was his own breathing and the edge of the ear's buzz of the overhead fluorescent lights. He flipped a mental coin and turned left. Good choice, too. The hall ended, and he was forced to turn right. A few steps later, that corridor ended in a cul-de-sac, with three doors similar to the one through which Wes had come only moments ago. Two of the doors were locked, but the third was cracked slightly open. Wes pressed his face up against the jam and peered through. December 4, 8.34 p.m. The room was a disaster area. The overhead lights were mostly out, mostly smashed, and emergency spots over the door provided the illumination. That, and the sparking of whatever controlled the enormous cage that took up nearly two-thirds of the chamber. Heavy, transparent walls were marked with smears of blood and other goo, and a black metallic portcullis of some sort was wrenched from its track. Through the walls, Wes saw a cot, a stainless steel toilet, and a television. Not much in the way of creature comforts. No wonder whatever had been here had broken out. The cot was overturned, and Wes didn't see a mattress at first. When he turned, he saw it in one corner, half covering a large man wearing bright red clothes, one eye swollen shut, but the features clear enough that he recognized... Gunter! Gunter. Now Santa Claus. But until last year, just an air conditioning repairman from Stuttgart, Germany. Groaned. Who... who is there? It's me. It's Wes Howard. He crouched and pulled away the mattress and tried not to gasp. What did this? Gunter's hands, Santa's hands were clutched to his large belly, which was home to a massive slash. He was holding his body together as best he could, but judging from the amount of blood darkening the already red garb, he wasn't succeeding. 
Professor, he managed. Professor said, see myself every year, see my, my air, how do you speak it? But every year, see, see myself, my evil. Your evil? What does that mean? West jammed his hand into the bag and sought help. What he got was a... a cell phone? How the hell is that going to help me? Who can I call to save Santa Claus? You're not evil, man. You're Santa. Evil... <laughs> thoughts. West tried again, concentrating harder, and this time got something small and papery. A business card. He was about to crush it and throw it aside when he saw what was on it. Need assistance? Call this number now. Wes swiped his thumb across the screen. Just hang on, he said. I'll help you, man, but you have to hang on. Trying. <laughs> Santa managed a small smile, almost lost in the bedraggled mess that was his thick white beard. Almost incongruous, given that Gunter had only been in his early forties when Wes had met him. He shook his head as if to clear it. Wes, you... Uh, you made it? Yeah, I made it. Wes tapped the dialer, then punched in the 15-digit number on the card. The voice that answered was one Wes hadn't expected to hear ever again. Hello? December 4, 8.45 p.m. I've done all I can for Gunther, said the small man. We need to get the hell out of here before the others come. He made for the door and Wes followed, just as he'd done last Christmas. It's good to see you. I thought the hit squad took you out. <laughs> Those pinballs. <laughs> A familiar laugh tossed over his shoulder as he led Wes back to... to the fireplace room, he supposed it was called. Oh, Bron, no finesse. I let them herd me to the closet, and then I was gone. Good thing. Once they were in the room, Wes pulled the door shut and then reached out a hand. I'm glad you're alive, Filbert. That makes two of us. The elf shook Wes's hand. Glad you called me, too. Last time he escaped, we had to scramble to train a new Santa to get the presents out in time. Almost didn't make it. He? Who, who are we talking about here? Filbert's mouth opened, then closed. His eyes narrowed. They're coming. Get in here. He jumped into the fireplace. Move it. Even with the elf at his side, there was plenty of room. Just what were you people keeping here? Oh, believe me, I had nothing to do with this. Before Wes could ask Filbert who exactly was in charge, a greenish glow surrounded them both, and they were whisked away. December 4, 8.55 p.m. Filbert and Wes were in a log cabin somewhere in, according to the elf, the middle of nowhere part of Montana. It was cozy and homey, the fireplace filling it with warmth. Filbert had promised the professor would never find him here, and then explained everything to Wes, who was having some trouble believing all of it. Let me recap, he said. Okay. You elves. Not me, Filbert said again. Fine, Wes said. The elves. He waited for Filbert to nod. The elves have a magic spell to dry out all the negative emotions that Santa Claus, whoever that happens to be, has, and feed them into this one person? Being. The elf corrected. Seriously? Would you stop interrupting me? Sorry. Wes nodded, as if to say, we'll see about that. He continued. All of Santa's negativity is forced into one being, who is then kept locked up and under guard. And once a year, Santa has to go down there, wherever there is, and confront him. Do I have that right? Just about. And exactly who was this being before the elves got to him? I'm not sure what his name used to be, Filbert said. In the 17th century, the way humans measure it, there was a legend of an evil creature that would steal away children, or beat them with switches. His name was Krampus, and he dated back much farther than Santa Claus. But he was a convenient scapegoat. For what? Wes asked. 
Around that time, one of the candidates was found to be suffering from what's now called antisocial personality disorder. He had a desire to kidnap children and, well, better you not know. The professor decided he'd be better off locked up. So he was stripped of his abilities and imprisoned. Imprisoned for more than 400 years? Wes said. Apparently you people don't have a problem with cruel and unusual punishment. Would you rather we killed him? I seem to remember you having a problem with that policy. I think this is just a touch more humane. You go right on thinking that. Wes plopped down onto a wooden rocking chair that was surprisingly comfortable for all its non-cushioned hardness. He didn't rock, though. Didn't want to get too relaxed. Instead, leaning forward and asking the question that was really on his mind. How did he escape? Filbert shrugged. Look, Wes, I know just as much as you at this point. I wouldn't have found out at all if you hadn't called me. And I still want to know why the bag gave me your number. Don't know. Filbert was standing by the fire. He turned to Wes. But I do know this. Krampus is out there. And he's got all the badness bled away from 400 years of Santa Claus. And with Gunther, with Santa out of commission, you're probably the only person who can stop him. How do you know Santa's still hurt? Don't you guys have magic? No magic can stand up to that kind of evil. Santa Claus is the only one who can stop him. Are you sure? Filbert lifted the hem of his shirt. A thick white scar marred the side of his small ribcage. He's escaped once, the late 1800s, and killed five people before we found him and brought him back here. That date tickled the back of Wes's mind, but he let it go for a moment. I got this helping to bring him down. The wounds he inflicts can't be healed the normal way. I was bedridden for a month. You saw what happened to Santa. And you expect me to take him on by myself? You're the only one who can, Filbert said. His magic doesn't work on you like it does on everyone else. Whose plan was that, exactly? I didn't set it up, Filbert said. You'll just have to take it on faith. He looked about to say something else when the fireplace flashed green and another elf stepped through. Filbert immediately put himself between Wes and the new arrival, throwing up a blue-white shield that looked awfully familiar. How did you find me? He snarled, one hand full of crackling magic. Oh, put that down, Filbert. I'm not here to capture either of you. I need your help. The voice made Wes's heart ache. And when Filbert lowered the shield, the blood rushed downward, just as it had done the last time he'd been alone with the lovely young elf, just about a year ago. Hello, Wes, Pomegranate said. I'm glad you're here. December 4, 9.05 p.m. Pomegranate Glitterfall, who had taught all the potential clauses the art of time dilation, still wore her little hipster glasses and her red and white hat cockeyed on her head. But unlike last year, she now looked completely serious. My father is working to fine-tune the magic we use to track Santa when he's doing his annual gift run. She said. Her father was the professor, the leader of the elves. He'll find you, Wes, and soon. And when he's done with you, he'll kill you. Didn't have much luck last time, Wes said. You had help. Yeah, he did. Filbert crossed his arms and glared at Pomegranate. He'll have it again. It won't matter. Next time he'll come for you personally. He's learned his lesson. We'll still try... Filbert began. She cut him off. You'll fail and you'll die. Both of you. I've never seen him like this. It's been a year, Wes said. I'd think you'd have let it go by now. Pomegranate shook her head. Still pissed off. This is his chance to get rid of the only human and the only elf who has embarrassed him like this. He's just lucky you're still alive because you can stop Krampus on your own instead of Father throwing an army of elves at him. And why would Wes want to help? Pomegranate glared at Filbert, but Wes said, 
The man's got a point. She sighed through her teeth. Because Krampus is a murderer, and there's no way you'll just sit by and let him kill innocent people. You're not that kind of man. Her dark eyes glittered in the room's firelight. I'll shield you from my father. I'll keep you safe. We will keep him safe, Filbert said. Yes, Pomegranate agreed. We will. She moved to Wes's rocking chair, heels making dull click-thud noises on the wooden floor of the cabin. She held out a hand, and Wes took it. Now, she said, let me show you what you need to know. December 5, 2.18 a.m. The streets of Volgograd were quiet at this hour of the morning. Quiet and mostly deserted. But Wes felt the evil that was Krampus. Now that he knew what to look for, now that Pomegranate had, for lack of a better term, downloaded everything she knew about Krampus into his mind, he knew the creature would be on the hunt. He just wished he wasn't alone. But while he tracked the thing that had mortally wounded Santa Claus, Pomegranate and Filbert were back at the cabin, constructing some sort of magical net that she promised would hold Krampus until they could get it locked up back in... in... well... Wherever it was, it was supposed to be. Wes still wasn't quite sure. It was the sound of boots on stone that caught Wes's attention first. He peeked out from his hiding place in the shadows, saw the woman in the fur-lined coat with the bare legs and the knit cap, and reached into her mind. Must get home. Her thoughts were in Russian, but Wes could read them all the same. He'd noticed that when reading the minds of other non-English speakers— all thoughts were in the same language. Get home to children. Need me. And, behind the woman, Krampus stalked with silent footfalls. Wes got his first look at the beast and felt himself cower, the reaction visceral and uncontrollable. Krampus was at least seven feet tall, covered in dingy white fur, or possibly hair, with two massive antler-like horns jutting from his temples. He carried a sack, the same dingy white as his fur over one shoulder, and a bundle of switches tied together in his other hand. Wes forced himself to melt back into the shadows, watching the beast practically glide past his hiding place, and, when it was far enough ahead, he followed. December 5, 2.24 a.m. Krampus passed through the door to the block of flats like it wasn't even there. Wes, though, didn't have that ability. He had to watch and wait, and when a light came on on the fourth floor, he ducked into the little shed in the alley, concentrated, and teleported himself into what smelled like a coat closet. He pushed the door open, ever so slightly, and watched. The flat appeared to only have two rooms— a closed door behind which the children probably slept, and the main room. Kitchen, threadbare sofa, old television, even older computer. Toys littered the floor, and as the woman shrugged off her coat and dropped it on the sofa, she nudged a few of them out of the way with one foot. Her hat followed the coat, and then she collapsed onto the faded green cushions. West touched her mind again. What did she want now? Ech, so much. Want a job where I don't have to stand all the time. Where I can be home for children. Where ugly men don't feel me up as I bring them drinks. He couldn't give her that. But at least he could save her from Krampus, who had just passed through the door and was standing over the woman. He murmured something in a language Wes couldn't understand, and she toppled to one side, instantly asleep. Well... That made sense. According to the information Pomegranate had placed in his brain, Krampus always put parents to sleep before exacting revenge on the bad children. The beast nodded, antlers somehow not catching and ripping on the rough ceiling, and moved toward the closed door, toward the children. December 5, 2.26 a.m. Though Krampus had walked through the bedroom door like it wasn't there, Wes had to open it the traditional way. He spent precious seconds trying to keep it as silent as possible, but when he heard a boy scream something in Russian, he decided to stop wasting time. 
Wes pushed the door open in time to see Krampus shove the boy down onto his bed. He raised his bundle of switches, and Wes felt a sick certainty in his stomach as to exactly how Krampus was going to kill this child. Wes was not a fighter. All he knew, he knew from watching movies. But in that moment, as Krampus prepared to strike, he was certain of what he had to do. He lunged across the small room, grabbing Krampus around his thick, powerful middle, and pulled with all the strength of Santa Claus. It was enough to make the creature take a single step back. If that, Krampus let out a low laugh that made Wes's balls shrink up into his body. And then the beast jerked his elbow back, smashing it into Wes's shoulder. He stumbled away, hit the wall, and tried to keep himself up as Krampus turned to face him. His voice was a vicious susurration, a language Wes couldn't make out. But the meaning slid into his mind like an assassin's knife into a victim's back. Your voice will shout. Your eyes will cry. Your heart will bleed. And then you will die. Krampus has come to take you down. Wes had a moment to consider the absurdity of the monster's rhyme. And it was almost too much time. He barely managed to avoid the bundle of switches, which thwacked on his bruised shoulder instead of his face. Burning pain tore through him, and he started to fold over. The next blow hit his back, and he howled in agony. But he didn't let Krampus get in a third shot. He lunged again, leading, stupidly on reflection, with his injured shoulder, and slammed into Krampus's crotch. The beast grunted, but at least Wes saw the switches fall to the floor before he himself joined them. As he rolled onto his back, he saw Krampus's pitch-black eyes narrow. Soon, false claws, your time will come. Then Krampus dove through the wall and disappeared. December 5, 2.27 a.m. Wes didn't care what the children saw. They were crying for their mother, he guessed, but he couldn't stay to help. His shoulder and back were on fire, and he could barely see through the blur of tears in his eyes as he crawled through the flat, trying to get to the coat closet. The mother was still asleep, but the kids were safe, and that was the important thing. Wes pulled the closet door shut behind himself, curled up into a ball, and concentrated on Filbert's fireplace. He was conscious only long enough to tumble out of the flames and see the two elves hard at work at a low table. Then everything went dark. December 5, 4.40 a.m. Wes had been overweight his entire life. He was used to waking up with aches and pains, especially when he slept for too long. But this time, when he woke up, the pain was different. His shoulder and back felt tight and hot, like he'd been burned, like the burns were pulsing in time with his heartbeat. He turned his head to one side. A few blinks cleared the blurriness out of his vision. And there was Pomegranate, for once without her hat, sitting on a too large chair that had been pulled up to the side of the bed. Hey, she said. You're up. He swallowed. Yeah. What? I mean, how long? Two hours, but in subjective time, a day and a half. Wes started and tried to struggle up. But Pomegranate laid a small hand on his bare shoulder. Bare shoulder? That meant... Wes felt his face flush red, and he turned away. It's okay, Wes, she said. It's still December 5th, still Krampus knocked. We have time to stop him. It's not that, he murmured. It's... He reached down, looking for a blanket, but there was none to be found. Wes... She moved her hand from his shoulder to his chin, turning his face toward hers. Wes, it's okay. He set his teeth and tried not to look down at the bulk of his body. Huge stomach spread out to either side, twin peaks of man boobs, all of it covered in just enough hair to look ridiculous. He touched her hand, moved it away, and then said, I need to get up. 
And where's my shirt? Pomegranate inclined her head to one side. Table, let me help you. He gave her an odd look. All due respect, but you're less than a third my weight. And, hey. That last was because he found himself being lifted off the bed by elf magic, tilted vertically, and then set gently on his feet. She hopped down from the chair. You're welcome, by the way. She was out of the small bedroom before he could think to thank her. December 5, 9.38 a.m. Wes still ached, but a massive dose of ibuprofen and a good amount of burn cream under some clumsily self-applied bandages, because he'd be damned if Filbert or Pomegranate saw him shirtless again, had helped a little. So had food, which Wes had taken out of his bag and shared with the two elves. Now he was in Perth, Australia, stepping out of a garden shed in time to see a young boy, maybe four years old, hanging from the monkey bars of his playset completely unaware of the massive white monster behind him. Wes knew he had to act fast. He had the net Pomegranate and Filbert had... had netted, or whatever the word was, but the playset was in the way. He couldn't throw it. He'd miss. He only had a few seconds. Krampus had a fresh bundle of switches in his hand, and while a four-foot drop wouldn't hurt the kid, those branches certainly would. So Wes ran across the yard, reaching into his bag. Aluminum baseball bat. And the weapon dropped into his hand. Krampus turned, lunged at Wes. But Wes leapt forward and swung the bat overhand. A terrific clang. The bat rebounded off the creature's antler. Wes felt the vibration up to his elbows, but kept his hands tight on the grip of the bat. Krampus groaned like an out-of-tune tuba, swiping blindly at Wes. But Wes was still moving. He caught the child around the middle and pulled him away from the monkey bars, setting him down near the garden gate. Stay here, he said, trying not to sound out of breath. Let me handle this. The kid's brown eyes were huge in his small face. Is there a monster? Wes glanced over his shoulder. Krampus was still trying to get his bearings. And then back to the kid. Yes, kid, a bad one. Are you you gonna kill it? He smiled, but knew it was weak. We'll find out. Krampus's voice was in Wes's ears as Wes turned to face his foe. That weird susurration again, and the words knifing directly into his brain. And it was just as eerie as the last time. False claws should know. He shall not find a way. He shall be filled with woe. With Krampus he shall play. Then there was nothing but deep, hooting laughter as the creature charged. Wes reached into his bag, grabbed the net, spared half a second to wonder if he should try a clever quip, and then flung it at Krampus. December 5, 9.40 a.m. Wes didn't care that Krampus's body had left a trail of smashed grass as he dragged it to the shed. He didn't care that he was knocking over the family's garden tools as he pushed the beast into it. He didn't even care that he had to stand on Krampus's thickly furred chest to reach the door and pull it shut. No, all he cared about was that he'd won. He'd defeated Santa's nemesis. Him, Wes Howard, the man who wasn't good enough to be the next clause. He stepped out of the fireplace in the Montana cabin, reached back, and pulled Krampus along for the rest of the ride. Your net, your net worked, he said. Filbert's mouth opened, and his eyes went as wide as the Australian kids. Pomegranate inched forward, her boots making almost no noise on the wooden floor. You, you did it? I did it. That's, that's brilliant. Filbert breathed, then louder to the other elf. Your father is going to be pissed. To say the least. Pomegranate came close enough to nudge one of Krampus's antlers with the toe of her boot. He growled, a cross between an elephant's trumpet and a lion's roar, and she jumped back. But he's trapped now. Wes heard Krampus's voice in his brain again. 
You think you won the battle, and perhaps this time it's true. Won't stay caught forever, and then I'll be coming for you. Well, he said, that's not ominous or anything. Let's not, Filbert asked. Didn't... Wes looked at Pomegranate, who was peering down at Krampus. N- neither you can hear him? He growled. Pomegranate said. Are you saying he can communicate? He can communicate with me anyway, and probably with Santa Claus. Wes lowered himself into the wooden rocking chair again. I wonder if that's what happened. What do you mean? Pomegranate was walking slowly around Krampus, making notes in a little pad she'd pulled from somewhere, using the pencil that had been holding her dark hair in a twist under her hat. Do you think maybe Krampus sang something? Sang? That was Filbert, who was standing well back. Yeah, he sings right into my brain. Uh, Not creepy or anything, really. He paused. Maybe Krampus sang something to Santa Claus, something that convinced him to let him out of his prison. I can't imagine that happening, Pomegranate said. Father would have been very clear. No one lets him out of his cage. This was a new Santa, Filbert said. Could he have disobeyed? I don't see why he would. The room was silent except for the crackling fire, Pomegranate's soft footsteps, and Krampus's heavy breaths. If Wes concentrated, he could almost hear the humming of whatever magic kept the creature trapped within the net, which cast a blue-green glow on its white fur. He watched the flames for a while, until Pomegranate finished whatever it was she was doing, and tucked her notebook back into a pocket of her skirt. That was when Filbert asked, When do we take him back? Oh, we're not taking him back to prison. We're not? Wes, who had been close to dozing, snapped wide awake. Because, I mean, what else can we do? The facility has been destroyed, she said. You two saw it, and I saw it. So what? Wes's hands tightened on the wooden armrests. We're taking him to my father, tonight. December 5, 6.20 p.m. For the past eleven months or so, if someone had asked Wes under what circumstances he'd agree to return to the castle in the north, the answer would have been, There aren't any, and how do you even know about that? But here he stood, holding the rope at the end of the net, Krampus trapped behind him. Filbert was at his side, and Wes could tell the elf's fingers were twitching, ready to shield the two of them should the professor send any more hit squads their way. Pomegranate, though, had been very calm about the whole thing. I'll make sure you're protected, she'd said. You'll have nothing to worry about. Now she was in front of them, in the professor's study, the three of them having just stepped out of the head elf's fireplace, and her father, Professor Butternut Tickety, sat behind his dark wooden desk, wearing the same white-trimmed red jacket he'd had when Wes was being trained. This time, though, It wasn't disdain writ large on his face. It was fury. You brought him here? The professor's voice was gravelly and very tight. Wes could tell he was holding onto his composure with every last shred of self-control he could muster. You brought him? He has a name, Pomegranate said, drawing herself up to her full height. And in case you hadn't noticed, Wes captured Krampus. And you brought that thing with you? He slammed his fist on the desk. What were you thinking, child? She was thinking, Wes said, stepping forward, that she might find someone who could stop the very creature you've been using to suck up all of Santa's bad thoughts for the past four centuries. The creature, by the way, that nearly killed your choice. He took a couple of steps forward, swallowing down the intimidation he felt. This elf, after all, had ordered Wes's death, and he could read Wes's mind without even trying. He had a feeling that the professor's eyes were still picking at his brain, even though he kept repeating nursery rhymes in his head, 
a tactic that seemed to have worked against the elf in the past. He met the professor's eyes and folded his arms. So how about we just call a truce and move on? The professor looked at the captured Krampus, then at his daughter, and then finally at Wes. What do you expect me to do with that? What, him? Wes shrugged, which he found harder to do with folded arms than he'd expected. Lock him up somewhere. Though I was hoping you might consider, you know, not pouring all of Santa's negative energy, or whatever, into him. He's pretty screwed up already. Wes felt Krampus's exclamation of surprise whirl through his head. A deeply discordant musical blast that made his teeth hurt. Clearly, the creature hadn't been expecting mercy from the man he called False Claws. Filbert was speaking now, apparently emboldened by Wes's standing up to the head elf. Even humans don't lock people up for 400 years, he said. And we're better than them. Wes glanced down at Filbert. Seriously, dude? The elf had the grace to look a little embarrassed. It's the truth. He's correct, the professor said. We are better than you. We don't kill indiscriminately. Unless you're killing failed Santa candidates, Wes interrupted. I would hardly call that indiscriminate, compared to what humans do. When Wes seemed about to argue the point, the professor cleared his throat. <clears throat> Wes decided not to fight that battle just then. We've created a system to bring joy to the humans. Without us, Santa Claus would be nothing more than a mythical figure. A waste of good belief. Okay, that needed further explanation. What do you... Do be quiet, the elf said, his eyes narrowing. Wes felt a tickle inside his head, and then the urge to speak suddenly left him. His brain wanted him to interject, but the words wouldn't connect to his mouth. We will handle the Krampus. You, human, you may go. What about Filbert? Wes wanted to ask. But his legs were already carrying him toward the professor's fireplace. With his eyes, he implored Filbert to do something. But the elf appeared glued to the ground. Then he saw flames whirling, spitting him out, without Filbert, Pomegranate, or Krampus, onto the floor of the cabin in Montana. And... Away from the professor, he could easily swear. Which he did, loudly, for almost a full minute, until he calmed down, sat in the rocking chair, and tried to think about just how he was going to save Filbert. Because he was pretty damn sure that the professor wasn't just keeping him there for milk and cookies. December 5, 7.04 p.m. Wes had a plan, but even he knew it was a bad one. He'd hop from fireplace to fireplace, closet to closet, as far north as he could. He'd use the bag to get keys to some sort of vehicle that could traverse the Arctic until he got to the castle. He'd break his way in, fight off whatever elven army the professor kept at his beck and call, and then... And then... Well, for one thing, that whole random vehicle to get to the castle part depended upon him knowing where it was, which he didn't and the professor's fireplace was untraceable. He'd stepped into the cabin's fireplace and tried to find it, only to be spat back out, stumbling across the wooden floor to land unceremoniously on his back, which still ached from where Krampus had hit him. Krampus. Krampus, who Wes could track. Wes got to his feet, dusted himself off, and reached into his bag. His baseball bat dropped into his hand. Then he began walking toward the fire, concentrating on Krampus. Secret Santa was coming to town. December 5, 7.07 p.m. Wes materialized in a dimly lit room that smelled like leather and manure, probably the reindeer stables. But the scent was forgotten when Krampus's mental roar flooded his brain and sent him crashing against a wall, knocking jingling sleigh bells every which way. The beast was close. Very, very close. Holding his bat at the ready, Wes found the door handle and pulled. The wooden panel was on well-oiled hinges, but he needn't have tried to be stealthy. A black-clad elf, clothes trimmed with gray fur, was already waiting for him, hands glowing purple. Wes didn't give him a chance to strike. 
He kicked out, and the blow that would have hit a man right in the balls thumped into the elf's chest. He flew backward, rolled a couple of times, and ended up in a heap. One down, one to go. Krampus called out again, and even as Wes's vision blurred momentarily, he was able to hear a plea for help. Wes didn't like what Krampus stood for, but there had to be a better way than permanent imprisonment. He concentrated on what he was calling, for lack of a better term, his mental radar. It only took a second to pick out the right direction. December 5, 7.09 p.m. The reindeer stables were big, as befit the building that housed Santa Claus's magical draft horses. The animals weren't here. West supposed it wouldn't be safe to keep them anywhere near Santa's mortal enemy, or whipping boy, or whatever Krampus was supposed to be. But as West reached the farthest stall, he heard Santa Claus's voice, weak but still distinct, intoning words in a language that West didn't know. That, in and of itself, wasn't weird. Wes only spoke English and enough Spanish to get by. No, the weird part was that the words were assembling themselves in Wes's brain, as Krampus's had done. Continue, said a gravelly voice, the professor. Finish the job. So tired, Santa said. There's no time. The professor sounded somewhere between exasperated and legitimately worried. Say the words. Only one guard remained, and that elf was staring into the stall as well, instead of being vigilant. Wes swung the bat, and it went clang against the elf's shoulders. He hit the ground hard. Wes hoped he hadn't overdone it. He could have knocked the elf over the head, but that might have killed him, and Wes wasn't a killer. The noise got the professor's attention, though, and he turned to Wes even as Wes raised the bat again. You must be joking, the professor said, and started lifting his hand as if to cast a spell on Wes. Wes dilated time, swung, and... December 5, 7.14 p.m. Hit nothing but empty air. He overbalanced and nearly fell, careening toward the back of the stall, toward Krampus. But he wasn't there. Neither was Santa Claus who, Wes remembered, had been in some sort of wheelchair and hadn't looked good at all. What happened? The professor had his hands behind his back. Santa was gone. Krampus was gone. And worse, Wes couldn't feel the beast in his head anymore. Whatever it was that Santa had to do, he'd done it. He'd made Christmas safe for another year, and all it took was pouring out his negative emotions onto a monster that wanted to kill children. A monster, was remembered a moment later, that had begged for help. If you want something done right, the professor said, you have to do it yourself, don't you? Wes growled and started to swing the bat, but this time the professor just held him in place. Do you really think that just because my daughter taught you how to control time, that I too wouldn't have that ability? The professor was keeping him from speaking again, and it was really starting to piss him off. Santa Claus has already passed this year's darkness on to the Krampus, and Krampusnacht is almost over. Once it is, you won't feel him any more. The professor chuckled and brought one hand around. His palm was open, but as he began to close it, Wes felt his heart grow heavy and hot. (laughs) Or at least... You wouldn't. Wes was quite certain what the professor meant. And he was even more certain that there wasn't a damn thing he could do but watch the elf's fingers come closer and closer together. As they did, his heart slowed and burned. And all he wanted to do was escape and never come back here again. And why had he come back in the first place? And why hadn't he just gone to find Filbert instead of seeking out Krampus and... Clang! Wes tumbled to the ground, gasping for air, clutching at his chest, his arms and legs tingling as his heart pounded. He managed to roll onto his back and blink tears from his eyes, and when they cleared, he saw two elves, one a woman in red with hipster glasses, and the other wearing green and carrying an aluminum baseball bat. It was good enough for Secret Santa, Filbert said. Yeah. 
Wes let out a long, slow breath. Yeah, it was. December 5, 8 p.m. I don't know where my father sent him, Pomegranate said. He's not here in the castle, that I know. Filbert and I checked everywhere he could possibly be. You'd be surprised how few hiding places there are for a seven-foot-tall creature with antlers like that. What about Santa? Is he okay? He didn't look so hot. He's recuperating, Filbert said. I'm going to stay with him, give him more recovery time. Pomegranate gave a small smile. Father can do it, but he's not nearly as good as I am. Without me, Santa won't make the delivery this year. He can't touch me. And I guess you'll disappear again, Wes said to Filbert. Kind of the plan, the elf said. You remember that whole thing where I whacked the professor over the head with a baseball bat? He's not going to be happy if he gets his hands on me. No, I suppose not. Wes sighed and took a couple of steps toward the fireplace. They were in the professor's office, which Pomegranate had said would be the last place he would look for them. Once he woke up, Wes had a thought. Question, he said, turning back to the elves. Yes? Pomegranate said. Your father said, a waste of good belief. What does that mean? Pomegranate and Filbert shared a look that Wes could only classify as worried. Then, without a word, Filbert raised a hand and pushed at the air. A bolt of blue-white magic hit Wes right in the chest. It didn't hurt, but it knocked him backward into the fireplace. A moment later, he was back in his hotel room, in the closet. That little bastard, Wes snapped. He closed his eyes, concentrated, tried to get back to the castle, but the way was blocked. He just kept landing on the thinly carpeted closet floor. Damn it! Nothing to do now but open the door, drop the bag, take off his shoes, and go to bed. It had been one hell of a busy 24 hours, and he hadn't slept in more than a day and a half. And now that Krampus was, well... Wherever the professor had stashed him, Wes just wanted to go to sleep. No, actually, that wasn't entirely true. What Wes really wanted to know was why the two elves had looked so concerned when he'd asked about belief. Until now, Wes hadn't really wondered why the elves kept the Santa Claus myth alive. He was so tired, though, that the question didn't keep him awake for very long. Author's Note. Hi, this is Josh Roseman, author of Secret Santa 2, Krampusnacht. After I wrote Secret Santa, I thought that maybe I would be able to turn it into a sort of franchise series of stories about Secret Santa himself. I think in the beginning, I wanted to make him a sort of superhero and have him face off against or team up with all sorts of mythological characters from various religions. And... Krampus is one of the most popular when it comes to Christmas. Um, Originally, I was going to have him face off against Krampus in the third story, and the second one was going to be sort of more of him finding his way as Secret Santa. But over the course of this year, while I was trying to write the Secret Santa sequel, the only story that really came to mind that I wanted to tell was Secret Santa versus Krampus. The thing is, as I wrote the story... Krampus turned into sort of a one-dimensional villain. He shows up to beat children or take them away. And I need a villain who's a little bit more than that. So I went back to our good friend, the professor, and I thought about how I could incorporate some of the stuff from the first Secret Santa story. And I do know what's going to happen in the third one now. And the sequel hook is laid pretty, pretty clearly. You don't really have to look that hard to find it, but I am going to write a third Secret Santa story, and I'm hoping that the Doonstief folks like that one as well, and that maybe we can turn this into a franchise. In the meantime, thanks so much for listening to Secret Santa 2 Krampusnacht. I hope you liked it. If you want, I did produce a Kindle version of Secret Santa 1, and I got a really awesome illustrator to put together some pictures for it. So please check out the uh, episode notes or whatever they're called. I 
can't remember. I'm having a bit of a brain fart. And you should be able to click on the link and go check out the cover, which is amazing, and pick up a copy of it if you'd like to. Thanks again. Talk to you soon. All right, everybody. Welcome back. And now a word from our sponsor. Hallmark Hall of Fame presents The Christmas Dildo. In the tradition of the Christmas shoes, the Christmas box, and the Christmas carol comes the Christmas Dildo. For the lonely young women and boys on our block, it filled more than just our hearts with Christmas spirit. Friday on CBS. Oh boy. <clears throat> we probably ought to screen our sponsors a little better because uh Shazam. So no, um, hey, no, that was a really good flick. The let's talk about the Christmas dildo instead of uh Krampus Knocked just for a minute. Okay. My favorite part was when the sisters couldn't decide who would Yeah, um I think we ought to bring back the hate letter of the week. Yes, thank you, announcer man, for keeping us on topic. Yeah. From the makers of the Christmas dildo, the Kwanzaa ball gag, and it's a high-powered rifle Charlie Brown, comes the cast list. Big Anklevich pulls double duty as both Wes and Butternut Tickety. Rish Outfield was Filbert and Santa Gunter. Guest starring Ken Edwards as the hermit crab who saved Christmas. Julie Hoverson once again lent her voice to Pomegranate the Sexy Elf. Featuring the voices of Aaron Zaradka as the Sleepy Ninja, Jonathan Hickel as the grief-stricken truck driver, and Julie Dinkins as the small-town sheriff. Amory Lowe as the producer, and the man who edited out the voices of the ninja, truck driver, and small-town sheriff. With special guest, crossbred Josh Roseman and B.D. Anklevich as Krampus. And Angelo Antonio Vespini Ferrucini Fredo Santino Vito Moreto Corleone as the Australian boy. Music and sound effect generously donated by the Free Sound Project. Promotional consideration by Roger Vomit Inducing Powder, Robbie Latham's White Hot Chili Beans, and the Dave Thompson of Podcastle Foundation for the Development of Superior Adult Bladder and Bowel Control Loss Research. So, uh, yeah, two things I'd like to talk about. One has something to do with the story, and the other has... Absolutely nothing to do with it, right? Well, they both have stuff to do with the story. First off, this this story was so much shorter than the first Secret Santa. It was kind of like when they have like a two-hour pilot film or whatever, you know, I... Uh -huh. And this was the you know, just the episode of the series. Right. It doesn't have the origin story in, in, involved in it, so it didn't have to spend so much time on that kind of stuff. No, and that's true. It's it's fun that you can just start and, and this is your show. But the, the, uh, the first story was really long. Yes, it was. And I think because this one was so short, we were able to get it out uh, on January 3rd uh, <laughs> instead of... But yes, we we did sort of have to scramble... To get this one in before Christmas. Which is funny because I I believe it was July that he said, Hey, do you guys want to do Secret Santa again this year? And we're like, oh yeah, totally, man. Give it to us. And then, yeah, we started working on it. I think December 5th. Krampusnacht. Everything just takes so much longer when you're old. <laughs> That's what she said. I, I think he mentioned one time. It, it, see, the first Secret Santa episode was really well received. I mean, as well received as any Dune Steve can be. And <laughs> there was encouragement to Josh about writing a sequel. And I kind of wanted to find out what was going to happen to the Indian candidate for Santa. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm, the one that calls him, wasn't it? Yeah, he does call in this episode, so he's clearly not dead. But uh, No, no, he called in the first episode at the end. Oh, he does. He doesn't appear in this. He one? He doesn't appear in this one. No. Oh, so that so the Indian character may be dead. Yeah, I think it's most likely that he is. That's too bad. I kind of wanted to know what was going to happen, and I think I asked Josh that when he said, "I've got an idea for doing a sequel to 
Secret Santa. But, you know, as he said in the author's note, he intended to write one story and, and ended up writing a very different one. And do you get the impression that this is the middle part of a trilogy? You know what I mean? Where it asks a bunch of questions that need to be resolved in the next story. Or is this just, you know, another segment in like a seven part? I think that it's more like that. I think it's just another episode uh, in the continuing saga of the Secret Santa. But I don't know. I mean, I could be wrong. You never know uh, the way that goes. It's like directors are all, all they seem like they're all gung ho about doing endless numbers of movies. And then all of a sudden they're like, no, no, this next one is going to be my last. <clears throat> the Dark Knight Rises was always what I was working towards. It wasn't meant to be just a series of good movies. It was just a trilogy. Yes, yeah, that I don't understand. And, and that's a whole different can of, can of worms or bag of cats. Sack of children. Yes, oh, that's that have right. have been switched again and but you again. Can, yeah, talk about that of just why somebody would have all these plans and then shelve them or abandon them. And, and you know, George Lucas is probably the seminal example because, you know, he used to talk about 12 Star Wars films or nine Star Wars films and then... Well, they're going to get there. <laughs> He knew that he could never manage to keep up with the Star Trek guys, so he just gave up. It seems like a lot of people that are like that, and then all of a sudden they're just like, oh no, yeah, it was always supposed to be a trilogy, and yeah, this is. And what is it with the trilogy? Why is three? Because of Star Wars, man, it has to be. Is it Star Wars? Right? I mean, what. Unless we're talking about religion, where else is there (laughs) the, you know, a, a, a three? You know, there there are only three to tell the story, beginning, middle, and end. And and maybe that's just how stories work, but... I don't know if it is or not, but I would want to say that it's an older thing than even Star Wars. I mean, it seems like novels have always been done in trilogies, although that's sort of starting to break down. And well, give me an example serieses. from a novel that there's a, that where there's a trilogy, because I know there's like four Dunes. And yeah, I guess that's true. And Lord of the Rings was never three books. I mean, it was, but it was always intended to be one book, you know, and it's broken up into, what, six parts. Hmm. But no, I mean, you may be right. I mean, I'm sure there's a, one listener that has their hand up like Hermione Granger right now. She's <laughs> like, I know the answer. I know the answer. Look at me. Uh, call on. She really is an insufferable know-it-all. Oh, yeah, that's true. Two points from Gryffindor for Cheek. Ooh. But there's no knowing. I mean, maybe the next story that uh, Josh does will burn him out and he'll be like, this is the end. And I always intended for there to be three, which is a lie, but it's always a lie, right? I I guess it's maybe just work. Nobody likes to be forced to do the same thing over and over again. Even if it's the best job in the world, being a human being means you'll find flaws in it and you'll long to do something else. And it's just like, right. you know. I'm so tired of making out with these supermodels. And he's like, oh, what I wouldn't give to just mow a lawn. So. Yeah, and it's it's funny that that happens. Like, I, there was a time when I used to, you know, I worked at one job. And I was just like, oh, I just hate this place. I can't wait to get out of here. And then when I got out of there and went somewhere else, I was just like, oh, my gosh. I miss that place. wish I could go back there. And that is human nature, too. You always... <laughs> Rose color your uh, your rearview mirror and rose man, rose plus man, <laughs> and yeah, I, I I had a really good job in L.A., but was it a really good job or is it a really good job in my mind because it's gone? Yeah, and the answer is I don't know. I remember being miserable there, but now it was so great to work there. And ah, anyway, I I hope that uh, if people liked this story, they let. Josh know that, and it gives him a bit of encouragement to keep it up. Yeah, I hope that he's able to continue loving this character and his adventures and try and find interesting things uh, for him to do and interesting people for him to fight and so on. Because I think it's it's got a lot of potential that it could really go a lot of places. And I think he needs to take maybe the cue from Harry Potter or one of those much longer series 
rather than Star Wars and the trilogy uh, ending it at three. You could take the, the, the cue from those fantasy series like like Robert Jordan or Terry Goodkind or all those where there's just dozens and dozens of volumes. You know, as long as people love it, they'll keep reading. And that's cool. Yeah, I mean, there are people like Stephen King or maybe J.K. Rowling. I'm trying to think of other people that write other things. But all anybody ever bugs them about is this core series mm-hmm. of theirs. And with, well, with Stephen King, at least, since I know him the best, you know, his his diehard fans just, when's the next Art Tower coming out? Come on, come on, come on. Until finally he just sat down and was like, okay, here's your damn Dark Tower. And he just put out three books back to back to back to shut people up. I got the impression that that was the chief motivation. Not even money. It was to shut people up. <laughs> That's why George Lucas made such crappy Star Wars movies to get people to leave him alone. <laughs> the, you could there's, under- there's an onus for writing something that's super, super popular, being known for one thing. Uh-huh. And uh, maybe that makes it feel more like work. It's an obligation rather than something that you're passionate about or something Uh you do for fun. You can understand Stephen King's fans getting antsy, though, because it was like many years between each one of those books. It was. You know, especially after he gets run over by a car. Everyone's like, dude, seriously, like finish this before you're dead, okay? But... They would have been so much better if he had waited seven years in between. I mean, they, it's just the truth. Maybe it takes some time to recharge your uh, your creative batteries. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And I I I beat this example into the ground, but you know, back when Richard Donner made Superman, the, the nineteen seventy eight Superman, he had this idea that he would be doing these movies for the rest of his life. And this is an interview that I read in two thousand when the the DVDs were coming out and uh, he was just like, yeah, I was happy to say, you know, I will hook my star to this wagon and do these for the rest of my life. And he and Tom Mankiewicz had come up with all these ideas for what they would do in Superman four and five and six and that kind of stuff. And uh, then of course he's fired and maybe had he been able to do Superman two and three and four and five or whatever, he would have been like, Oh, F this in like 1983 or 84 I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. But because they took it away from him, it becomes all the more precious to him. It's all the more, you know, the one that got away. Uh huh. And uh, we'll never know where that would have gone or, you know, even where Superman 2 would have ended up eventually. Because, you know, if you've ever seen the ending of that movie, that clearly wasn't what they were going for. And it does sort of sour his version of Superman 2, and uh, what are you going to do? Anyway, I guess that's just what I'm saying, is if if suddenly people were demanding Josh Roseman write, you know, the sixth Secret Santa, and, you know, it's the end of August, and he knows that he has to be midway through it right now if he's going to get it published in time for the holidays, maybe suddenly it's not fun anymore. It's not something that you want to get behind. And And... That sucks about human nature. It's I, I think it's something that everybody experiences. At least I experience it. And via solipsism, everybody experiences it. He could take some time off, maybe a Christmas or two, and then get back to it. The good thing about writing novels as opposed to films, they're not just going to go on without you. You know, it's your character. Not somebody's just going to be like, hey, well, I'll do Secret Santa then. Screw you. You're off. You're fired. I don't care if it was your idea. Yeah, I see, a weird thing is uh, just around the time that we're recording this, Brian Singer has announced that he's directing X-Men, what is it, six or seven or four or nine? It's hard to say because which ones count? But, you know, that's what happened to him. You know, he was developing X-Men 3 and, you know, signed on as the director and Warner Brothers offered him the chance to reboot Superman and he took it expecting that X-Men would still be there with him, that Fox would have loyalty to him and <laughs> Fox, <laughs> they didn't. Duh. Then you know he he made his way back and and now he seems to be in that director's chair again and he's unwilling to stand up because it's musical chairs apparently. <laughs> I mean that shows I guess how much passion he has for these X Men movies. I guess that he he wants to do more. Either that or the regime has changed at Fox or 
you know, a tremendous amount of money is paid to him to do that. Whereas to do a Valkyrie sequel, he would get nothing. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that there could be much of a sequel to Valkyrie because I saw that and it didn't end well. No, it didn't. <laughs> Hitler won World War II. It was it was kind of a surprise there at the end. Didn't see that coming. <clears throat> I, I I mean, I've not written series of stories or anything like that or i've not written anything that's been popular enough for people to say hey where's the next kind of thing i Um, I think if you look at the comments of the calling you might find a few people saying that to you sir and see that would be an interesting experience if i didn't write a calling sequel and i put out my own stories like house of ideas or something and people are like, yeah, it's not the calling sequel. That's all I want from you. <laughs> you said you were going to do the Twilight books, but this time from the male's point of view. Why aren't you doing that? F this host stuff. Right? Isn't that what happened? with What's her name? I don't know. Don't follow I'm, her career. I'm quoting all you, by the way. Okay. I, I did hear about that stuff from my wife that she was supposedly doing them from the male point of view. I don't know anything about that. The F the host thing reaction, though. I, anyway, I, people hate to be tied down. People hate to be obligated to do certain things, I'm sure. Even if it's things that everybody else would long to do or they're, they're paid unbelievably well to do. There's got to be some kind of middle ground. And, and in filmmaking, a lot of times there is a middle ground. And, and, they, and in the industry, people have nicknamed it one for me and one for them. And, you know, we're like Christopher Nolan with Warner Brothers had this Batman franchise and as part of his contract is, yes, I will do another Batman film, but you've got to let me do whatever else I want in between. And so he did Some The Prestige that. and Inception. Inception, there we go. Those were his, his you know, one, f- for, one me. for me movies. And shoot, what's the new one called? It starts with an I. Anyway, it doesn't matter. That seems like a really, really good setup. I mean, he's in a position of power where he can dictate terms yeah, and all that. It's... But even so, he quit on the Batman franchise, didn't he? I mean, I you, so. you didn't need to end on the third movie, especially with Christian Bale, you know, still being in his 30s and they and they stopped. I mean, they ended on a high note and all that, but they certainly could have done more Batman films. I don't know. It would be interesting to see. One thing that I think is kind of interesting sometimes... And I want to say that I heard this on Dean Wesley Smith's thing. He was talking about his wife, Christine Catherine Rush. Do you have to have three names? You do. Yes. Is that just the way it... Uh, maybe this B.D. Anklevich thing is not the way I should go. Maybe well, I should go full full three names. Oh, okay. What about J.K. Rowling? Yeah, I guess she does yeah, pretty well. That's three names, isn't it? Ish. I mean, her, her, her name's not J.K. I know. So she, I don't think she her middle initial isn't even K. It isn't. It's no. Joanne K something. I don't rolling. think it's K. I think that's something that she. I, I heard that somewhere that she just needed another initial, so she just put that one in there. I think it belongs to somebody else. She stole it. But anyways, uh, he was talking about how sometimes a writer will be doing a series of books, and they'll write the first four books in the planned seven book series or something like that and you know they've got fans there are people that read them they people that buy them but unfortunately for the publishing company they just don't feel that it's enough and so they just all right no thanks for the rest of that series and suddenly (laughs) there's this series that just goes becomes an orphan it doesn't have a home to finish itself up with and they were talking a lot about how now with self-publishing becoming such a thing and becoming so popular that that kind of problem has kind of gone away and now they can just, hey, I got the rest of these books and sometimes they'll even have them written already and the publisher's just like, yeah, well, you know. Oh, you got another one of those? Oh, well, we're not really interested. More Harry Potter, though? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the opposite thing that could happen where you're still passionate about it, but... The people who are in charge of publishing are no longer passionate about it. And yeah, the nice thing is that's kind of a thing that's going away. You can publish it if you want. Nobody's going to stop you. You just put it out there. And if people want to buy it, they can. And you don't have to be published by anybody in particular. You just go to Amazon and say, hey, got this book. Put it on there. Such as Josh did with his uh, first story. 
And I'm sure you'll probably do with this one as well. Josh, in the comments, tell us, how has that gone for you? Have you sold a lot of copies? And have you heard from people that know Secret Santa from Kindle? Sorry, from Amazon rather than from the podcast. You know, Abby Hilton would always talk about... She would always try and encourage us to sell our stuff on Amazon or on Smashwords and would talk about, you know, her podcast audience versus her text audience. What would you call that? Prose audience? Either one would probably work. The blind versus the deaf. Yes. And yeah, but I mean, Abby's in a really unique situation because she has an illustrated version and she has just the text version and then she has the full cast audio version. And then there's certain things that she just has the straight read version of and teach their own, I guess. I mean, that's essentially what it is, is you, you have it your way. And now yeah. a word from our sponsor. No. <laughs> the the self-publishing thing is is neat, and I hope that Josh has gained a bunch of new readers rather than just listeners because of that. You know, I was surprised. I'm not going to say disappointed, but I was surprised that he hadn't revised Secret Santa from the podcast version because it seems like you could listen to our performance of it and say, okay, I could expand on this part, or oh, I'm not really sure I like that line, or you know, I just listening to it makes you think, oh yeah, you know, he could have said this, or oh, oh you know, a better line would have <laughs> been this, or it's like, huh, but what happened before he walked into that room and that, and you know what I mean? Just to sort of stretch it out, to build on it, to you know, everybody has heard of a, a writer who has started out with a short story, and then somebody said, why don't you expand on that? And they turn that short story into a novel. And that, to me, seems like a giant challenge. Where do you start to expand and stretch? And how do you tackle that? Because if it is just taking the skeleton of the short story and keeping that same skeleton and just building on it until it becomes this just amorphous mass expanded in all directions, I don't think it would work the same way. You have to change the the structure of it. And maybe where it ends as a short story, it no longer ends. And maybe, you know, the inciting incident has to come way, way, way later now. Uh, that I, You know, I don't know. I'm just not experienced enough as a writer to have had to do that. I don't know. I, mean, I think maybe some people are different than you and that when they're done, they're done. You know what I mean? Because I know that you say that you constantly can revise mm-hmm. stories and, and you're, you have a hard time ever just finally saying, OK, this is it and moving on. But I think there are other people out there who are just, you know, I've written it and I'm done. And, oh, yeah, it might be better if I did this or put in this line or change this around. But you know what? I wrote that story. and I'm done. And I'm going to write this other story now instead. Well, and that's exactly what Dean Wesley Smith used to say in that book oh, right. that, of his that you would always peddle. Uh, he would talk about it. You know, it's just like you can continue to polish the stone or whatever. But why not just put the stone out there and start on a new one. And, you know, he, he made it sound like it was detrimental to a writer to, to even do another draft. He'd just be like, put it out there, send it to magazines or whatever, you know, start on the next one. And he would, he, he went as far as to say, if you know, there's a flaw in this story, still send it out and work on that flaw in your next story to make sure that if there was a problem with the characters being one dimensional, that rather than fleshing out the characters in the story you've just written, try and write three-dimensional characters in your next story. And to me, that's just like, wow, why, what, what, who, why, they... But everybody's different. Dean Wesley Smith's philosophy may be the answer to a prayer to one writer and just be a big wheelbarrow full of steam and horse shit to a writer like me. But, you know, everybody has their own way. There's not one correct way of doing something. Definitely. Yeah, I think his deal was just to get people to keep writing because I think uh, someone like me, for example, has a tendency to not write. And so he's just saying, go, you got to write a bazillion words or whatever before it stops being crap. So write more words. That's something you've been struggling with since I met you, I think. Mm -hmm. And you're certainly struggling with it now, or at least your last blog post talked about that. But everybody can improve. Mm-hmm. nobody is perfect and nobody does everything that they could you and i were talking the other day about a certain filmmaker who never reached his potential who was too lazy and fat <laughs> you know it was easy for me to dismiss this guy and say he could have been a contender but instead he's just a bum but nobody reaches their entire potential 
You know, you, I, I read this massive book about Alfred Hitchcock and all of these projects that he wanted to do and he never got to do. And finally he was old and nobody cared anymore. You know, Universal was just like, eh, you're an old man. You're no longer relevant. And he had all these projects that he had nurtured and one day I'm going to be able to make these. And he, and he never did. You know, somebody that made, I mean, Hitchcock made like 45 films. And yet there were all these stories he didn't get to tell. Nobody gets to tell all of their stories and get to do everything that they want to do. And it's, it's not fair, but it's just something I guess you have to come to terms with or you have to pick and choose your battles. And this story is more important than others. And yeah, if you've got a publisher who's saying, ah, yeah, that's fine, but we need another, whatever it is, you know, another Percy Jackson knockoff, then somebody's picking your battles for you, but you, you got to do it. Uh, what's his name? Orson Scott Card. You used to always talk about what he'd say is uh, he had all these ideas for books that he wanted to write and he'd go to his publisher and they'd be like, no, we need more of your Ender. I almost said Ender knockoffs. What do you call them? <laughs> Ender shadows. Yeah, the, the 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 ones that he'd finished his Ender's books, but he's write more Ender's books. Go in there somehow and write tangential Ender's books. And, and that's all he seems to write nowadays. I know that's not true, but that's all anybody cares about. Yeah, it seems to be. Those Ender books sell a lot of copies and the other ones less. Yeah, seem, I mean, I don't know. It's not like I follow publishing sales stats or anything, but... That's the way it seems to be, considering that they keep coming out with more and more and more of the Ender ones and other ones that he said 15, 20 years ago he was going to do, he still hasn't done. I'm guessing they're not coming at all. Like the past watch sequels he said he was going to do, those aren't coming. Those are done. He's never getting to those. And yeah, when Abby came and visited us that one time, she said something like that. And I know I've talked about it in an episode before, but it was so horrifying that I've never forgotten it. And it's worth mentioning again. She said that she's not going to live long enough to write all of the novels she has in her head right now. And to me, I was just like, wait, you mean as a 30 something, you have a bunch of novels in your head. And by the time they're out, you'll be dead. <laughs> and that's exactly what she meant. She's like, yeah, it's, I, there's not enough hours in the day. She works and she tra travels and, and, does whatever else that she does. And she's does. planning on killing herself real soon. Well, so see, there's if, that if that's the case, then yes, it, her <laughs> words were super prophetic. But it just, yeah, that, uh, she seems to write a lot. A lot with a capital O. And uh, That's a weird capital. Yeah, I mean, it is weird, isn't it? And yet, you know, she's not going to make it through. I, Stephen King writes more than anybody you and I could ever know. And there's a lot of stuff that he's never going to get out. Yeah. So I, I believe the last time we had a writing conversation, you promised everybody it would be our last one of the year. Oh, fudge. So I'm going to go ahead and redirect our conversation away from what we can write and what we can't write and uh, go back to Krampusnacht. Okay. <clears throat> Are you a fan of Krampus? Oh, you have no idea. It's had, I, did, I wasn't aware of Krampus growing up. Me he, neither. He was not part of my religious upbringing, unfortunately. <laughs> we need more like boogeymen for the holidays. Um, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't until adulthood. Although I, there was an episode of The Simpsons early on, back when the show was good, where I believe Martin Prince talked about Krampus in their Christmas play or whatever. And, <laughs> Martin Prince. I mean, it didn't say do anything f for me at the time because, you know, as kids... You hear about all these crazy effed up customs of other people and, you know, people in Des Moines, you know, these these foreign lands. You just I, or at least I I just would dismiss them uh -huh. because there's just so many and they're each is more messed up than the other. You know, whether it's, you know, putting the the wooden shoes out for something to fill at night or, or whether, you know, the, the three wise men is or the ones that bring the presents rather than Santa. You know, all that's the, the holiday folklore, if well, you will. Well, wise men did bring presents, so it kind of makes sense. Santa Claus, I don't know where this guy came from. Yeah, you know, there was, there was somebody I knew when I was in high school who said that he was in Switzerland. Now, this may be incorrect, but he was saying in Switzerland there was St. Nicholas who would come and bring presents. But he had his assistant, Sandy Klaus. And his assistant, Sandy Klaus, had a bag that the naughty children went into. 
<laughs> kind of like Krampus, I guess. Except for he wasn't this hairy beast. He was just a guy. Well, I'm sure like those a... are the same. And right, they, And right, just yeah. over the centuries, those two have split. They were originally the same legend, uh-huh. if you will. Um, or, or, I mean, what they are essentially is a tool to get your kids to behave. Right. You know, Santa isn't, it's going to bring you coal or isn't going to bring you anything if you don't shut the F up and go to sleep. Or, you know, you take it a step further. It's just like Santa is all good and joyous and white and an emblem of Coca-Cola, <laughs> but the black, hairy, disgusting, hooved, satanic beast Krampus, he's the one that he, oh, he would love nothing more than to sodomize you, son. <laughs> I mean, that's the sort of thing it is. Those are made up for... I mean, uh, uh, unless there is a historical precedent for for Krampus. <laughs> you, l- you look at me like I'm going to tell you this historical precedent. Please do. Actually, uh, there is. Yeah. Uh, there once was a guy from Nantucket. I mean, sorry. <laughs> there once was a guy who, uh, yeah, wandered the land, stealing children, switching them with a bundle of switches. And maybe sodomizing. I don't know about the sodomy. <laughs> I'm not sure if that was part of it. No, yeah, I have I have no idea. I'm sorry. Um, but no, uh, it, I, it's funny because a, a few years back, gosh, how many years has it been? Three. Just three? a one, a two, a three. I want to say it's been more years than three back. You sent me a link to a song that was a commercial, right? Was a commercial on like the G four network or something? It like was that? like their station identification things that they do. It's a, they're, you're in television. What do they call those? Uh, it's a bumper or something like yeah, that. Yeah, like a bumper for, or promo or whatever. All the ones on your station are just abominable. <laughs> and I, they they're use, abominable on pretty much every station, I'm afraid. Right, but but yeah, this one was yeah one of those things where it was just their Christmas holiday greeting thing, or whatever, and it was a Krampus song. And, uh, yeah, you sent it to me so that I could make an MP3 of it for you so you could add it to your Christmas playlist. Oh, and it's divine, man. Uh, You know what? Do the listeners a favor and sleep with their lonely sisters. Okay. Uh, But before you do that, would you play the... It it was from G4, which was the video game network back in those days. I don't know what it is now. I'm sure it's reality show related. Yeah, it's a reality TV show Uh, station. But but would you play that? Because it's it's only like 30 seconds long. Okay. Uh, Yeah, if you remember at the start of the show, um, Josh Roseman, the famous trombonist, was actually No, 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 the other one. No, no, it was the trombonist. He was playing it on his trombone. Oh, see, now I'm confused. Yeah. He played it for us a little. But uh, here's the song, and uh, we'll be back in a second. It's a weird song, it's a fun song, it's a silly song, and I enjoy listening to it every Christmas, now that it's part of my Christmas playlist, too. Yeah, well, and, and it was brought to my attention, yeah, it was like six, seven years ago, that they're, you know, in some cultures, Krampus is kind of revered, or maybe not revered, but he's held up there as a, an emblem of the season, as a dark side to Christmas, and they, you know, they would have parades and someone would dress as Krampus whereas and someone else would dress as Father Christmas and I I looked him up on Wikipedia and you know this country's version of Krampus and this this story of Krampus and it delighted me in the way that 
Wikipedia tends to delight me. I, I don't know. I, 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 <laughs> do you get just joy out of clicking on a link and, and then it's like, oh, I never know about this. I know I've talked about that endlessly on the show. But it's like a throwback to an earlier time when people read to enlighten themselves. And it's just like, wow, I, I, I now I know about the the river sign, you know, and, and where it where its tributaries are and, and, <laughs> and what it brings to the people that live around its 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 expanding banks. Yeah, it is kinda of like that. Kind of. It it makes me think of the time from the uh Thirteen Nights of Halloween when we looked up the history of Halloween and trick or treating and then wound up doing a whole show about it, <laughs> our adventures in Wikipedia. I was thinking about that. So we've got a Secret Santa story, and then we've got a Secret Santa story about Krampus. Are there other holiday folk that you think will be worked into these uh, stories? Will there be a Rudolph? Well, I, what, Was there a Rudolph? Did we have Rudolph in the first story? He, he had reindeer. He did have reindeer. And I think there was references to reindeer in this one as well. Where he went into the, f- the, the, the Frosty the Snowman. Well, episode. yeah, you could do whatever you want. I mean, you could have Jack Frost be a character. You could oh, have... You could have a Yeti. The uh, Yes. You could have, like, the old man of New Year or whatever that's a week later be actually a figure in reality. You could do Mrs. Claus... You could do... The Mrs. Claus? <laughs> and now I no longer want to talk about <laughs> Secret Santa. But, but yeah, there are lots and lots and lots. It's funny because I was talking to you just earlier today, before we started recording, you asked me if I'd... Did you ask me if I'd written a, a Christmas story this year or if I'd ever written a... When, no, you said, when was the last time That was right. you wrote a Christmas story? And I tried to think about it, and I was about to say never. And then I remembered that, no, I actually did do The Spirit of Christmas with you. So I had written one Christmas story ever. And that's it. Like, I've never... For some reason, I don't get Christmas related ideas none of the ideas back in that foggy dreamland landscape were wearing red hats with white trim well we said we wouldn't talk about writing again but what is it about christmas stories that turns you off nothing i like christmas stories i enjoy them but for some reason i don't I'm they're just nothing coming to me related to them. Well, but your complaint through the years and thank Christ I haven't heard it this year <laughs> has been that every single Christmas story is about kids don't believe in Santa Claus and they have to come to realize that there is a Santa Claus and that and you're like well, how, why would I well if there is a Santa Claus and I'm trying to instill in my children a belief in Santa Claus why would there would be characters in a movie that don't believe in Santa Claus? You know, it's like, why are all the children in children's films, holiday films, non-believers in Santa Claus? Are the, am I reiterating your point well or not? It's close-ish to what I've well, I should my, have my, it memorized by now. You would think. Yeah. You had to bring it up. I haven't, I haven't thought about it in years. Year. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's just... I, I wish there would just be movies about Christmas where Christmas and Santa Claus is just one of those things that everybody accepts. Adults, children, anybody. Because if Santa Claus is real, then he's real. Parents wouldn't disbelieve in him because he shows up at the damn house with a bunch of presents every year. And if he's not real, then he's not real. And why are we trying to convince children that he is real? Well, that's a whole nother episode. Maybe we should do a That Gets My Goat holiday episode where we talk about that. And yeah, the people, the parents that are like, why are you trying to convince your children of a lie? Oh, I'm going to be waiting for them in hell. <laughs> oh, believe me. Seriously, I mean, there's going to be like molten shit that I'm going to be have stirred up and ready. It's like, <laughs> Mr. Daniels, I've been waiting for you. Wow, you live to be 91. It's been a long way. But, you know, this stuff ferments. So come on in. I don't like holiday stories. Because they always seem so formulaic. It's not necessarily right. the, uh, you know, the people don't believe in Santa and then they're forced to. I mean, that's the plot of a lot of them. But it, Christmas is a lot of things to a lot of different people. 
but not according to the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> and nope, it's just a dildo. It's it's a time to play things really, really safe, to be non-denominational, non-offensive, non-specific. And when you paint yourself into that small a corner, there are only so many stories that can be told. And yeah, I I love Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. I love it to frickin' death. I, I have a necrophilic obsession with A Christmas Carol. But if uh, I never see an adaptation of, you know, it's just like, well, the boss is grumpy on Christmas, and so three ghosts are going to come visit her and show her the true meaning of Christmas for her employees or whatever. It just, I'd say a third of all <laughs> Christmas specials or Christmas, you know, movies for Lifetime or Hallmark or whatever it is, are that, or just some retelling of the Christmas Carol. Did you see the Simpsons one where they did that, where he sees the Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol, right. and he's he's like, oh my gosh, and then these ghosts came, and they're like, it's the Christmas Carol, you've never seen this before, Dad? He's like, what? What? <laughs> Somehow he's gone his whole life without seeing any of the bajillion adaptations of the Christmas Carol. But okay, hey, Josh, if you're still listening, <laughs> you dumb bastard. <laughs> but if you are still listening, I wouldn't mind seeing Jacob Marley's ghost show up in one of Ooh. your Secret Santa things. I know it's it's not a, a traditional Christmas character or whatever, but he's still out there, right? And he's still suffering yeah. for his, his sins are... and stuff. That I, And I know people have written sequels to Christmas Carol or, you know, the redemption of Jacob Marley stories and all that. And I like that because I love A Christmas Carol and it's just... but. That you tend to, because Christmas is, a, or at least started out as a religious holiday, or was co-opted into a religious holiday, or whatever you want to say, people are really sensitive about it. And, oh man, I remember the stink when A Nightmare Before Christmas came out, and how devil-centric that was meant to be. And again, it's 20 years now, and and you look back, and you're just like, <laughs> really? <laughs> really, that was controversial, you guys? That was something that you had to make a stink about? But, you know, it's just anybody trying something different that rattles the chains a little bit seems to. Chains you forged in life? That's right. You know, I, 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 I made them link by link. It is a ponderous tome. I, I've talked about stories that I've written for Christmas. And granted, I, mine tend to be irreverent because I'm not that guy. I told you about almost getting to write one of those Hallmark Hall of Fame <laughs> Christmas things. or and, and, you know, I wouldn't have been able to. I would have written a first draft not been paid for it and it would have been thrown out and given to somebody else and they would have taken my idea and gone in a better place with it because my I don't work that way I even if I have a change of heart or a Christmas you know somebody's heart growing three it's times that days it's, it starts out in a dark place or goes in a dark place or whatever it's just I, I there's something so saccharine and ungenuine about so many of those you know, about the the grouchy old guy that lives in, uh, on the end of town and all the kids hate him. And then at Christmas, you know, they bring him a, a Christmas ham and it turns out, you know, that he's just lonely and that he had his heart broken by Julie Hoverson years ago. And, and it, he's a <laughs> he's a good guy and they have him over for Christmas dinner. And he, the old man that lived down the street was not really putting bodies into the garbage can full of salt in uh in Home Alone. Home Alone movie. Dude, that was a good film. I mean, the violence notwithstanding, that stuff about the old man is powerful even today. I, I, I like that. And maybe I was subconsciously mocking that. <laughs> um, Does Home Alone count as a Christmas movie? Oh, absolutely. Or is it just set at Christmas time? Like uh, we were it's talking way about, more Christmas centric than we like Die Hard or Die Lethal Hard Weapon. and Gremlins and stuff. But that one is legitimately Christmas, despite the story not really being Christmas. well you can disagree i in my opinion it is it's it well the sequel was also christmas in new york right it was in new york and i think it was lost in lost new in new york it wasn't was it christmas related i think it was christmas time probably but because every time they would be stuck like i think in this in the first one they were in france right because they were going to europe for christmas weren't they yeah and they were seeing uh, it's a wonderful life in french on the tv mm. and then in the second one they're in miami and they're seeing it in spanish on the tv <laughs> and that's right and zuzu says teacher says every time a bell rings kevin McAllister maims an intruder that's right that's right yeah, i don't know the there there is potential for telling christmas stories and and you'd think that people 
would do it more because those suckers get trotted out again and again and again forever. It's why we why artists always put out a Christmas album uh-huh. because they're so damn easy. Yeah, they're really and, easy. The songs are And it's a written. license to print money. Yeah. Well, we talked about that with every single Have you ever heard that, that Have you heard that Stephen Colbert song? Uh, I want to say it's called It's Another Christmas Song or something like that. I'll have to play it for you in a second. Yeah, he uh he sings all about all those songs that are played ad infinitum and then I realize someone must write them. And he goes on and on about how uh, he's making money like crazy. And he's just like, feed the Colbert children. It's, I don't know. It's a pretty funny song. You'll have to check it out. As far as, as Christmas stories go, I'm sure there are people that would find Secret Santa and Secret Santa 2 uh, to be irreverent. You know, to be not appropriate for Christmas fare. But... I mean, that's precisely the the dark turn that that first story took is what changed it from, hey, this is a good story to, oh, wow, this is a great story. Uh huh. Partly because people are really touchy about that sort of stuff. And, and, and it's like, well, you wouldn't want to make anybody look around and go, wait, hey, wait a second. And that's what he did in that first story. I mean, there was a dark undercurrent to it. The fact that Wes is so bitter and... That life is so unfair to him and, he, you know, he's been screwed and it turns out for nothing. There's bitterness to that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, maybe you don't want bitterness in your Christmas story if you're, you know, used to watching the Tiffany Network. But I think that's one of the things that made it come alive to me is that there was, a, there was something genuine going on in there. Uh, and I, I would hope that uh, somebody out there finds the same kind of thing in there and and, and looks forward to this kind of tradition uh, of having a another Secret Santa Wes story every year. I know I ended on a really weak note. I'm sorry. I hope they do too. I find it really interesting. It seems like it's kind of tailor-made for our show and our interests. It's a Christmas story about a superhero Santa. So it couldn't be more perfect because how many hours have we devoted to talking about superheroes. So we just add Santa into it and boom! Awesome. Um, so yeah, uh, Josh told us that he's already got the idea for part three. And he'll send it on to us, I'm sure, sometime in July and probably around November. We'll get back to him. And then December 15th, we'll rush it out. And, uh, yeah, January 3rd next year, you can look forward <laughs> to the show, the, the story making our show. If you uh, would like to participate in the conversation, we have forums and we have comments. And uh, I know uh, that you really look forward to, oh, hey, somebody commented on the story. Oh, it's just spam. <laughs> It's something that we never outgrew, that we, we still need that reassurance. We need somebody to say, hey, you did a good job. You're a good son. And let Josh know that as well. I mean, maybe he's a human being and he needs encouragement as well. He needs to hear that people liked the second story before he can write a third. And maybe not. Maybe he's tougher than me. <laughs> and he's like, well, I'm going to write it for me. I don't need anybody else to hold my hand while I do it. If so, that's cool. I mean, the guy can play the tr- trombone like nobody's business. And, you know, he's a pretty uh, talented writer as well. And I hear I he think, does a really, really good... Uh, I, I think you might be getting confused about the Josh Rosemans, because there's two of them. Never mind. Thanks for listening, everybody. Happy Christmas, Han. Han? Happy Christmas, Harry. Happy Christmas, Ron. Good night. Krampus! Krampus! The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. The Dune Steef audio fiction magazine does not cause hearing loss, but sometimes it does make it seem like an option worth considering. Take two. 
Krampus was at least seven feet tall, covered in dingy white fur, or possibly hair, with two massive antler-like horns jutting from his temples, and a giant dong. He carried a... (laughs) I had to make sure you were paying attention. I think I may have even, I think, Starship Sofa. Ooh, you... I don't think you could hear that, could you? 